So I guess I had the honor of being the first person to open the Project Unity 5. Looking back now, maybe that was a bit of a punishment. Um, but it definitely was a pretty daunting task at the time. The first thing we really, we really had to do with all this was to figure out if it would even work at all, which uh, meant we had to essentially do a very stripped down kind of a new branch for just the artists. We had to essentially just rip out lots of unused things that weren't critical to just uh, this early kind of prototype. And there's a bunch of errors. Your game doesn't look as pretty as it used to be. There's a lot of pink textures maybe. And then you're working your way through code that has been deprecated, code that doesn't work anymore. We went through and we either had to make modifications ourselves, or in some cases we just commented out the code, deleted different things that were causing problems just to get it so that it was running. One way to start the process of going and updating your script code for the new version is using the auto-updater. The auto-updater may be able to get most of the compiler errors out of the way. You may need to manually do some replacements though. You'll need to check the console for compiler errors and respond to each one individually. Uh, having to actually do some of these manual edits actually has been uh, ultimately a good thing for us. You know, a lot of the things that uh, Unity was uh, kind of uh, doing with this auto-updater as like a fixed mechanism was, was that they were better um, exposing some of this, this stuff that they were doing under the hood that was uh, more um, uh, expensive. Doing it all kind of like uh, manually um, in the end allowed us to kind of more fine-tune how do we hang on to references to certain uh, new components and stuff and uh, reuse those as opposed to like repeatedly just, you know, and get component, you know, one after another. And we finished the proof of concept, and uh, but with all the changes that we had made, like deleting code, you know, commenting stuff out, we couldn't go forward in that branch. But what we really had to do was move forward and get everything else working. This is like design, all the implementation of all our plugins, all of like the actual core gameplay. The most important thing uh, that we had to keep in mind while migrating was to do things in a way that kept people unblocked so that they could keep working. So we created a new branch for designers so that they could uh, keep working on the design of like episode four. We created a new branch for uh, artists, which was like a stripped down version. Then we, we had sort of an intermediary branch where uh, developers could fix all some of, the, some of the migration issues that came up. Unity 5's new 64-bit editor uh, can be used so that you can load more things into memory. That's very useful for say artists. They need to load in a lot of assets at a time and say some of our import processes can go much faster. Upgrading to 64-bit may lead to incompatibilities with some plugins, so it's very important to contact the authors of your plugins that are having issues on the 64-bit editor and see if they have a 64-bit version. So once all those issues were ironed out, then we brought the art assets over to that branch and we moved the designers over to that branch, and that's kind of where we are today. Getting transferred over to Unity 5 is a big win in and of itself, and uh, Unity helps you along the way and helped us along the way with uh, the auto updater, fixing a lot of the, the issues with the incompatibility for us. But now the task at hand is what can we do to take advantage of Unity's physically based shading? Probably one of the most intimidating features in Unity 5, and it was a huge test for the entire team.